Welcome to Nobody Told Me. I'm Laura Owens. And I'm Jan Black. Tens of millions of meetings are held in the workplace every day. Studies have indicated that 9 out of 10 employees daydream during meetings, and 47% say having to attend too many meetings is the number one time waster at the office. So what can be done to stop the daydreaming and time wasting in meetings? Our guest on this episode, Dr. Stephen Rogelberg, has a wealth of information about that. He is a professor of organizational science, management, and psychology at the University of North Carolina and the author of the book, The Surprising Science of Meetings, How You Can Lead Your Team to Peak Performance. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Tell us how you became interested in the topic of meetings and how the book came about. (laughs) Okay. Well, um, so I'm an organizational psychologist. And as an organizational psychologist, um, I'm very much interested in understanding and working to improve the world of work. And my personal interest is identifying things that are most frustrating to people and see if we can find some evidence-based paths forward. Uh, So clearly, meetings fit that bill. It is a real source of frustration. And I was just incredibly motiva- motivated to see how, what the science says about it and conducted research, um, believe it or not, for over 20 years on the topic of meetings. And I reached a point where I was doing a lot of corporate speaking. I was publishing a lot, um, mostly, you know, so I had this juxtaposition of academic work and then talking to companies. And I said, you know what, I think this is the right time to put together this book. And so I wrote the book um, this past year. It was a lot of fun. Um, Released it on, um, I think, January 2nd. Um, Really not sure if anyone was going to read a book about the science of meetings. But to my utter surprise and delight, uh, the next day, Washington Post named it the number one leadership book to watch for in 2019. And it truly was just shocking. Um, As a professor, that's that's your only dream is that people will want to consume your science. Mm-hmm. And so since then, it's just been going crazy. And I've been really, really thrilled about it. We talked about some of the statistics related to meetings in the intro, and it's just really surprising how many people feel they're ineffective and also the cost they have to the economy. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that and the main reasons why people feel like meetings are not effective. Sure. Um, You know, so there are approximately 55 million meetings a day in the U.S. alone. Um, This is a massive investment organizations are making. These are real costs. You can cost out a meeting by looking at time and salaries. Um, You could argue that if you identified, if if there was one line item on a budget that um, goes completely unexamined, it's meetings. And this one line item is probably the biggest unexamined um, item on a budget. Uh, there's a tremendous investment make going, uh, going on in organizations. Um, and the research shows that only around 50% of time in meetings is a good use of time. Um, that means 50% of the time people are saying, why am I here? This is not engaging. Um, I'm not being included. Uh, This isn't relevant to me. Uh, So clearly there's a problem when it comes to the return on this massive investment. Well, can you tell us more about the dollars that are actually involved? Give us a sense as to how much money is is wasted in bad meetings. Well, uh, so some statistics suggest that in the U.S. alone, around $1.4 trillion, $1.4 trillion, Um, is spent um, in, you know, for the just sheer amount of meeting time. And so if you put that together with my statistic around 50% of meeting time, um, you know, not being effective, um, that's <laughs> over seven hundred you know, $700 billion of wasted money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you think meetings are needed for if so many of these are a waste of time and just kind of called on a right. whim or – just put on the calendar because that's how it's always been? That's such a great question. Um, You know, while we can, um, you know, yell at meetings, hate meetings, complain about meetings, a world without meetings is much more problematic. Mm -hmm. Uh, Meetings are essential for communication, cooperation, coordination, consensus, decision-making. In many regards, organizational democracy 
takes place in meetings, right? Meetings are an evolution from, um, you know, structures that existed in the Industrial Revolution, where it was all command and control, where we didn't care about um, employee voice. Um, so we definitely, um, we definitely need meetings. But, you know, the key is not to eliminate meetings. The key is to just eliminate bad meetings. And that's where the science can be so incredibly helpful. How so? Take us, take us into that. Take us into the science. Well, the science is massive, um, and basically the science has identified, um, you know, key success um, factors that seem to, you know, really promote effectiveness. Um, you know, my book is really different from other books in that I don't say first do A, then do B, then C, because mm-hmm. um, that's not what the research suggests. What the research suggests is for leaders to be intentional, you know, make decisions, right? Just don't dial it in. So much of meeting behavior is just habits. And these are recycled habits that you're taking from other dysfunctional leaders. So we can start leveraging science, you know, to decide on, you know, how to create agendas. Science speaks to all these things. And I'm very happy to talk about any of these topics. You talk a lot in the book about the huddle. And I thought this was really interesting. Can you expand on that? Sure. Um, so huddles are another one, another technique, right? It's an, it's a potential technique that can be done and is effective in some situations. So huddles are examples of speedy meetings. Uh, they're typically 10 minutes or so. Um, they are absolutely wonderful for bringing a team together quickly and creating alignment, getting everyone on the same page, doing a quick scan of challenges or problems. Um, you know, identifying some topics that maybe everyone needs to be aware of that day. So it's, it's akin to the huddle, like in American football, right, where the play is called. So huddles can occur every day, every other day. It's kind of a nice way of starting a day. Um, you know, there, there are some keys to success. Um, you know, you want to have them at standard times. Um, you want to evaluate them frequently because sometimes they get stale. Um, so you just want to keep getting employee voice and how you can make these huddles better and better. Um, also, huddles tend to be about the here and now. Uh, so sometimes there are more strategic issues that just can't be discussed in a huddle. So those you park. And what I suggest is that on everyone's calendar, every two weeks, there's a block of time, an hour called magic time, which everyone is committed to keep free. And magic time is where you put those more strategic issues, those longer term, longer thinking issues. um, And that's where that discussion happens. And if there's nothing that needs to be talked about during magic time, then magic time is just canceled. Our Nobody Told Me interview continues in just a minute after we tell you about our sponsor, trustandwill.com, which features estate planning simplified. An estate plan outlines how you'd like to care for the things that are most important to you, like your kids, your pets, and your home. Have you been procrastinating about finishing your will? Thanks to TrustInWill.com, you can finish in just 10 minutes for all 50 states completely online. And they have people available to instantly answer any questions you might have. Laura and I are a mother-daughter duo. And as you can imagine, I want to protect her and the rest of my family in case something bad and unexpected happens to me. I couldn't believe how easy the TrustAndWill.com website is to navigate. It walks you through the whole process, helping you decide what's best for you at whatever stage of life you're in. Seriously, it's so easy. Do it for your family. Do it for your loved ones. Guardianships start at $39, wills at $69, and trusts at $399. Gain peace of mind by protecting your assets in your family. Take 10% off by going to trustandwill.com slash nobody told me or entering promo code nobody told me at trustandwill.com. Again, take 10% off by going to trustandwill.com slash nobody told me or enter promo code nobody told me at trustandwill.com. One chapter in your book is called Meet for 48 Minutes. Tell us more about that. Yes. Um, Well, you know, the typical meeting time is an hour. And do you want to guess why the typical meeting time is an hour? (laughs) Um, Tell us. Okay. Um, Because that's the default setting and Outlook Mm -hmm. and Google Calendar. And that's just not a good reason. 
um, especially given something called Parkinson's Law. And Parkinson's Law is this idea that work expands to fill whatever time is allotted to it. So magically, a meeting scheduled for an hour takes an hour. Well, we can use this to our advantage, right? We could say, all right, given these goals for this meeting, well, how long do I think it should take? I'm not going to be a slave to my calendar program. You know, perhaps this meeting is going to take 48 minutes. And Parkinson's law will generally result then in a 48-minute meeting. Um, So what I want leaders to do is be intentional, be purposeful. Choose your meeting time that makes the most sense. And once you choose that time, I even want to challenge you further to try to dial it back five minutes or so. Create a little pressure because the psychological research suggests that when teams are under a bit of pressure, they actually perform most optimally. So, you know, embrace your intentionality, embrace your role as a steward, pick the right time for the job. And the beauty of it is that any time you don't meet for an hour, you are giving the greatest gift in the world to your people. Right? You're giving them back time. And there's nothing that people want more than time. Mm-hmm. Do you think that if you need a long meeting, okay, so say you need to have that hour long meeting, do you think that people should have breaks during that time? Or do you think it's a better use of their time and they, they feel it's a better use of their time if they just go straight through, if the information is really needed in it? Right. So that's a, another great question. Um, you know, you could certainly have meetings for an hour. There's nothing wrong with a meeting for an hour if you have enough content mm-hmm. for that hour. Um, but you bring up this point. Well, you know, so do people need a break? And here's when I do think they need a break. Uh, some, um, as you know, there's a lot of multitasking in meetings. And this is a result for lots of reasons. You know, people are really busy, but there's also a lot of technology addiction out there. Um, So if we're going to ask people to kind of park their phones during the meeting, that's going to cause some anxiety. There is actually research that shows that when groups stop midstream, they actually wind up producing higher quality decisions. And the reason being is it stops the runaway train. Right. Like sometimes you take that little break and the first thing that's said is actually something contrary to what was going on before the break. Hmm. So there are some definite merits. Yeah. Interesting. I would have thought that it would have sort of taken the energy out of the meeting if people take a break and then go back to it. But, you know, I also think that if you sleep on an idea overnight, usually you'll end up waking up and feeling a little different. It must be kind of the same idea. I think so. Um, no, but just the caveat is, like, this isn't a break where people are leaving the room. This is just literally a stretch break. Mm-hmm. People are standing up, they're looking at the phones, and then they're sitting back down and back to work. And talking about standing up, tell us about the difference in terms of effectiveness between standing up meetings and sitting down meetings. Yeah. So this is a really fun research finding. Um, you know, basically, what you know, what's been found is that um, standing up meetings and sitting down meetings basically produce um, very similar quality decisions, but standing up meetings take nearly half as much time. So they have a level of efficiency to them. Um, you know, coming back to a topic that you broached earlier, I think huddles are great candidates for standing up meetings. By getting those folks together and having a 10 minute standing up meeting, I think really keeps that focus. It keeps the meeting from, um, you know, really running over as well. So I think, you know, what, like one of the things I really stress in this book is I just want meeting leaders just to keep thinking about all the choices they can make, right? So standing is one choice. Huddles is another choice. Um, 48 minute meetings is another choice. There's just choices. And this act of making choices is a difference maker. Um, You know, what we find is that the best meeting leaders have something in common. And what they have in common is that they inherently inherently recognize that they're a steward of others' time. And when you recognize you're a steward of others' time, you care. You care about what people say when they leave your meeting. And interestingly, we have this stewardship kind of mindset all the time Mm -hmm. when we meet with customers or our boss's boss, right? We never want those people to leave the meeting saying, oh gosh, that was a waste of time, right? So we're very thoughtful. But when we meet with our own people, we, with our peers, we just kind of put that stewardship behavior aside. And it doesn't take long 
right? We can make a host of really meaningful decisions around a meeting in one minute. And that's going to be a difference maker. So how can leaders ask their employees for feedback and an evaluation for how they guide the meetings? That's great. Um, I'm a big fan of simplicity. Um, and so going back to this, the, the concept I just shared of being a steward, right? One of the things that a steward does is they recognize that um, if they're calling a meeting, um, you know, inherently those p- individuals in that meeting as I mentioned, have a good experience and you want to identify what they think about the meeting. So basically every few months, you know, doing a Qualtrics or survey monkey um, or giving people a piece of paper and just have them identify what's going well, what's going not so well, what can we do differently? That's it. That's it. Just gather that feedback and there's going to be so much low hanging fruit, but is there anything that more demonstrates being a steward Right. When you ask people about how am I doing and what can I do better to make this a valuable use of your time? And if everyone does that periodically with their meetings, we're not going to see the same level of complaints. Right. Because we're going to start becoming responsive to the complaint. Right now, there's no responsiveness to complaints. Can you elaborate on what you found about meetings that start late and meetings that end late? Sure. Um, so we've conducted some experiments about meeting lateness. And what we find is that those meetings that start uh, 10 minutes late um, have really negative effects on the decisions made in the meetings. Um, the groups don't identify, identify as many ideas, and the ideas they identify aren't as high quality. So that meeting lateness seems to actually contaminate how the group works together. And interestingly, we videotaped groups. And we started coding behaviors that we observed. And what we saw is that those 10 minute late groups, people like would interrupt each other more. Um, there were more side conversations. So there was definitely kind of this negative affect that seemed to permeate uh, the meeting. But what's also interesting though, is that just as bad as starting late is ending late, um, right? When a meeting ends late, you're kind of breaking the contract that you had with employees. Um, and people don't appreciate that, especially because typically there's another meeting that they have to get to. Right. <laughs> right. What are some of the best leadership qualities that employees respond best to? Is it humor or being engaging or taking the employees out of the typical meeting space? Right. Um, so, you know, I, so these leaders who are stewards, who recognize their stewards, they they do behave differently in meetings, uh, right? So first of all, they, they certainly act as hosts. When people show up in the meeting, they welcome them. They make introductions, right? They express gratitude. They start the meeting off on the right foot. Mm-hmm. And even if the meeting is going to be discussing really, you know, maybe bad stuff, it's still kind of creating the frame that these are challenges that we're going to work together and we're going to solve. So that, there's that host behavior. And then after that, there's the facilitation behavior, right? The leader doesn't want to dominate all conversations because if they were going to dominate all conversations, then they didn't need a meeting. So they're facilitating. They're making sure that people are engaged. If they're noticing that Sasha's quiet or Gordon's quiet, right, they're on it. They're saying, you know, hey, what are your thoughts, Sasha? Um, hey, Sandy, do you agree with what was just said? And right, so they're just constantly engaging the group, creating interaction, they facilitate well, and then they end well, right? They make sure that be, when people leave that meeting, they know what was accomplished, right? They know what decisions were made, and most importantly, taking this is taking some verbiage from what Apple uses, they know the DRIs, the directly responsible individuals, right? So no one's left wondering. These are the takeaways. This is what we're going to do. And here's who's responsible. And that has all the ingredients for a good meeting. Are in-person meetings, face-to-face meetings, more effective than meetings via Skype or or some video conferencing, something like that? In general, our research shows that face-to-face meetings are more effective um, than remote meetings. Um, 
you know, these remote meetings are just plagued with different, with just more intense dysfunction. Um, you know, the, a meeting leader needs to do more. Um, they have to be more dialed into the dynamics, and they typically aren't. So these remote meetings tend to tend to just not have the, the quality that you would like to see. And is that also because you have people who are maybe on their devices during the meeting and they're not going to get caught? Yeah, that's a great comment. So, yeah, so we have research. We ask people what's the most dysfunctional meeting type. They'll say remote meeting. If I ask them what meeting type do you most prefer, they say the remote meeting. Right. And, <laughs> <laughs> so, right. So that's because they can multitask. And so that's why to make these remote meetings work, you really have to try to create presence. Right? We need to make people be present. So this could be accomplished in a number of ways. You know, you can get people on video as opposed to just audio, right? To make them really, you know, make everyone be seen. Um, the leader just has to constantly be calling everyone out by name all the time. Even the people perhaps sitting with her or him in the room, every name is being called out. Um, the leader is being that air traffic controller, constantly talking, you know, talking, getting other people involved, even keeping a little checklist of who's who's spoken and who has not spoken. You know, they're using the chat box, um, you know, to identify whether anyone else wants to talk. You know, if someone says, hey, you know, I would like to say something, they can do it in the chat box and that leader, boom, calls on them. Um, they're leveraging some alternative, um, you know, technologies, like there's these great meeting apps, you know, designed to take quick votes. Um, so they're kind of doing that type of stuff as well to kind of really test consensus. And then I have a more controversial recommendation um, that actually kind of gets me in trouble, but the spirit of the recommendation is sound. Do you want to hear that one? Sure. Okay. So this, <laughs> the recommendation that I put in the book is consider banning the mute button. And I don't mean at all that you should not have the mute button. We need the mute button. But think about if you ban the mute button. If you ban the mute button, People would attend a meeting in a quiet place. People would attend the meeting while they're not eating. People would attend the meeting while they're not walking their dog. People would attend their meeting while they're not in the bathroom, right? They would have to be present. They would have to find a quiet space and be present, which is exactly what we expect of people who are attending meetings face-to-face. So while there certainly will be exceptions, I still like the challenge that everyone is trying to attend the remote meeting such that if the mute button was banned, it would be okay because they were thoughtful and, you know, positioned themselves to be fully present and ready to engage in the meeting. One of the interesting things you say is that bad meetings beget more bad meetings. Explain more about that. Yeah, so, you know, this is just the idea that we recycle practices that we've experienced. But let me unpack that in a slightly different way. Research suggests that only around 20% of leaders receive any training on how to lead a meeting. I mean, think about that for a moment. That is utterly insane. 55 million meetings a day and only around 20% of people receiving training. So people really don't, it's a crazy. So people yeah. really don't know how to do this. So when you really don't know how to do something, what you do is you just use what others have done, what you yourself have experienced. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the MO. So these bad practices are just, they become normative. In fact, it, you know, organizations have just kind of, they've seemed to have been in a place where they're just assuming that bad meetings are a way of life, a cost of doing business. And, you know, candidly, that's why I am so excited about the success of the book, because to me, it's signaling that maybe that's not the case anymore. You know, to me, it's signaling that organizations do want to start owning their meetings and try to solve this because it's actually not that hard to solve. Um, you know, there's lots of good science that provides suggestions. 
And, you know, if leaders act on these suggestions, they collect feedback from their folks, organizations start to do training, organizations build into their employee engagement surveys, some content around meetings so that there's feedback and accountability, you know, like we can solve this problem. We can take, we can get all the good out of meetings and really decrease the amount of bad. What organization do you find gets the best feedback from their employees in terms of how they run their meetings? Uh, okay, none. <laughs> none. In a none. word, um, you can find good meeting leaders everywhere, uh-huh. um, but but no organization is really nailing this. Um, you know, there was a time that I felt that Intel was the absolute champion of meetings. Um, the CEO, Andy Grove of Intel, just he elevated meetings. Every employee was required to have training in meetings. In fact, he took it so seriously that he would conduct a lot of the training. But after Andy, you know, um, who, who, um, you know, was no longer CEO, it seems to, you know, those practices didn't seem to continue. So I really don't get the sense that any organizations, you know, really nailing this, but you actually can find leaders who you know, are acting in a way very consistent with the book. How can you move on if you're conducting a meeting and someone in the meeting is talking too much or belaboring a point or an issue simply isn't getting resolved and clearly won't get resolved during that meeting? Well, meeting science would suggest trying to design an environment where that problem never emerges. So meeting science would say, you know, you can prevent that from actually happening. Um, I'm a big believer in trying to elevate other voices to kind of counter those voices. So, for example, your quiet voices, you can assign them agenda items, right? So good leaders don't have to own every agenda item. If you want to bring more voices in, you give them an agenda item to run. You ask them to, to participate, right? So you, you push more voices up, and then those other voices become quieter. Um, other design issues are... You know, you start the meeting by clearly by stating expectations like this never happens. Right? where meeting leaders say, listen, I want to have a really good meeting. I would want, I want to hear from everyone. I want everyone to keep their contributions short, though, so that we have plenty of time. I want people to truly listen to one another. I want conflict, but conflict of ideas, right? Establish norms. Another great technique is you get people in, in pairs. Um, so you take three minutes and say, hey, we have this topic to discuss, but before we do so, get into pairs and chat about it. That simple action will actually create a completely different dynamic. And then finally, another super technique is to actually leverage more silence in meetings. The research suggests that when you brainstorm or ideate in silence, as opposed to using your mouth, so kind of writing ideas down or using an app, Nearly twice as many ideas are created, and those ideas tend to be even more innovative and disruptive. Right? So if a meeting leader truly wants to create an egalitarian, very dynamic meeting, sometimes having no talking is the best way of achieving that. Interesting. And Stephen, you've given us so many great nuggets during this interview, but we always ask our guests at the end of our show, what is your nobody told me lesson? So what is it that you wish someone had told you about meetings long ago that would have saved you from needing to learn a lot of hard lessons? Okay. I love the question. And I will, I will share with you my, what my biggest derailleur was as a meeting leader. And that was, I was afraid of conflict. Um, I just wanted to create meetings with harmony. Um, I felt harmony was synonymous with success. And that's, not, that's just not true. And if you only focus on harmony, um, just really good, important decisions just aren't made um, or they're not made well. And so I got feedback on it and I started to recognize that I need to build meetings that do introduce um, more discrepant ideas, you know, more constructive conflict, but try to create a culture where the conflict gets resolved effectively so that people leave the meeting not feeling wounded, but energized that a good discussion ensued. And uh, Stephen, how can people contact you on social media and the internet? Excellent. Um, well, 
the I have um, a great re- uh, website with lots of resources on it. Um, and they can get to it two ways. Uh, so they can just go to the surprising science.com um, or they can go to Stephen uh, So either the surprising science.com or Stephen um, and visit my website. And, you know, and then I have a very big presence on LinkedIn. Just do a search on my name. Um, I would certainly love to connect. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope people do reach out. Um, it's a topic that I'm certainly passionate around. And, um, you know, I just anything I can do to help folks on their journey to take this vexing workplace issue, leverage science and, um, you know, this make forward progress. Well, thank you so much. You have had some wonderful things to say, and I think you've expressed what a lot of us who have attended meetings have felt before. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully we won't be attending well, yeah. so many bad meetings so many in, the bad ones in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. That's our, right. Our thanks to Dr. Stephen Rogelberg, whose book is called The Surprising Science of Meetings, How You Can Lead Your Team to Peak Performance. And again, his websites are thesurprisingscience.com and stephenrogelberg.com. I'm Jan Black. And I'm Laura Owens. You're listening to Nobody Told Me. Thank you so much for joining us. 